Well, I want to welcome everybody to Profit Pros Ag uh, July monthly webinar. And we're really happy to bring you a, a, a continuous topic tonight talking about our full circle system. And this will be a series that we're doing. And I uh, am Dr. Jim Ladley, sure. and we yeah. uh, operate out of Albert Lee, Minnesota, and operate across the upper Midwest. We also have uh, Dennis Clockengay with us, who is our lead uh, crop management consultant in the company. He works out of Sauk Center, Minnesota, and works for clients all over the country. Uh, we really, as a company, are promoting you know what we call the full circle regenerative and sustainable livestock and uh, crop production system. And it is a full circle. Every year in farming, we have a chance to go around again. And what we found is that every part of that system is connected to all the other parts. And so we're gonna talk about this evening. Uh, we're gonna have a series over the next four or five months on this very topic. Uh, next month, we're gonna talk about the fall residue uh, digestion program that I think is very, very important for everybody to hear and to understand. Uh, the information that we provide tonight is being recorded and will be archived on our website, ProfitProAg.com. You also will be able to uh, type in questions if you'd like, and Dennis and I will respond to those. So this is really part two of our series of the Full Circle Farming and to discover the secrets of practical regenerative crop and livestock production. And tonight, we're gonna to talk specifically about a technology that is very unique, that really uh, can be used to optimize our production systems. Last month, we talked about our microbial team of technologies, and that's very exciting. And we'll review some of that with you tonight as we go through the program. And so I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. And either you were emailed or you get off our site, profitproag.com, the PowerPoints that we're gonna go over tonight. So as we go through this presentation tonight, one of the things that we are focused on as a company, we feel there's a group of individuals out here uh, we call them the regenerative millennial producers. And these generally are producers who are 25 to 40 years old, tend to be a little bit more progressive. And they're really on the social media and their social media mindset. And most of the time when they go to purchase a service or a product, they've done thorough investigations and have about 75% of the information they need to make the decision to buy or not to buy and what impact that would have on their operation. And I've noticed in the last couple of years, this group is expanding. And we have quite a group of individuals now that we're working with that fall within that category. This happens to be one of them, Matt Wongan, who farms east of Albany, Minnesota. He's standing in one of his cornfields. And as you can see on the left is the UBUL NBS Natural Biological Stimulant uh, treatment. You can see the corn is darker green, has a wider leaf versus the corn on the right that wasn't treated. This is the kind of technology that these individuals are looking for that will give them a competitive edge. Now, when we look at the Regenerate or the Sustainable Program, there's really a number of things that it results in. And this is a farming system that can be repeated indefinitely with a positive impact to the environment, the food chain, the gross profitability and consumer health. All the things that we wanna, again, really focus on and magnify. And of course, the most important one is what can we do to re reduce cost and improve profitability. But it will result in a net gain in soil productivity, carbon fixation into humus. And of course, uh, nowadays we can actually get carbon credits for fixing carbon. And that's something that we will evaluate uh, probably next week when we talk about residue management. 
And what, of course, the other thing is creating or producing nutrient dense food and feed and fiber. And so very, very important. Improve air and water quality, sustainability and profitability in animal production systems, net improvement in consumer health, and improvement in profitability. That's what the system does in the cycle. So the key takeaway is building healthy soils is a key to, to spending less and getting more. Now think of the fence row theory. All of us that have been around farming for any length of time at all, realize and have seen where we pull out a fence row between two fields. Maybe it's, uh, you know, we're bringing two fields together or maybe we bought the land on, on the other side of the fence or maybe we're renting it now. If you pull that uh, fence out of there and farm that, that's generally going to be your best crop for the next five to seven years until we bring it down to the level that our rest of our farm is in. And the reason is because that, that soil is very natural. It has all the key uh, microbial diversity in it, uh, nutrient availability. Generally in those areas, it's very healthy. We don't have the disease complex there. And so what we want to be able to do over a period of time and it doesn't happen in one year. It probably takes three to five years to really get to this point. But it's to bring that fence row to all the rows in our farm. And profitability in farming is really all about balance and all about soil balance is the key because everything is derived from the soil. And one of the things that I've seen this summer and in past years and have studied is the impact of crop residue on our crops on how the, the degree of growth and how vigorous the plants are, their color, uh, their overall health. And I was driving down the road today, looking off to my right, and there was a soybean field. Uh, this time of year, those soybeans should be filling the row. In this case, there was a rod, lot of residue in the field, and the soybeans hadn't really filled the row at all, and they didn't look very well. And I, I've really looked at a lot of fields this year and studied it. And I think crop residue is our number one enemy when we look at crop production, especially on corn and soybeans. And I've gathered a lot of information and, and pictures this year that I want to share with you next week. I think in some cases, crop residue could be taken as much as 30% to 40% of our yield potential away. And, and again, that is something that we want to talk about in length next week. So tonight, what are we going to learn about? Well, we're going to learn about five things you must do to control cost and boost ROI. What is the number one thing you must understand to put Mother Nature to work for you in developing a healthy microbiome? And again, when we talk about the microbiome, this is the mi microbes that are in our environment in all aspects of our life. It's the microbiomes in the soil, on the plant, in the animal, in ourselves. And probably the microbiome is the most important thing that we should focus on and deal with because that determines the health of living things along with nutrition. We'll learn about two essentials that every sustainable farmer requires to really get to where they want to go. And that is be, look at crop rotation and cover crops in your cropping sequence. Why is that important? Well, that helps build diversity rather than monoculture of corn and soybeans or just corn. And that diversity is really the key to creating a healthy environment. And, and and reducing disease, insects, weeds, as well as producing more energy in our crops and more quality. We'll learn about the top four things you must mi uh, minimize to grow plants that, are, that naturally defend themselves from pests and diseases. And that is, number one, we got to reduce the toxic materials that we put out in the field. And they come in the form of high salt fertilizers, anhydrous, and pesticides. This one's is something that you go cold turkey on in one year. 
in many ways, I think of industrial ag as being we're really drug addicts. We're we 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 get to fix every year with the with the nitrogen we put on, uh, and with the high salt fertilizers we put on, and really in many cases we put the natural system to sleep, or throwing it out of balance. And we'll talk about why the tiniest factors often make the biggest difference to success in achieving nutrient balance and availability, especially the trace elements that are critical that drive taste, flavor, nutrient density, and energy in food and feed. And we'll learn about the easiest ways to get started with the full circle system. A hint, the foundation is the fall crop residue digestion and what I call nutrient and energy recycling program or system. And that is something we're going to cover next week and something you really want to hear uh, us discuss because that sets the stage for the coming year. Why balance is really the key. And, you know, when we look at balance, balance to me is critical when we look at soil. And it, if we have balance, we're going to reduce stress and we're going to we're going to magnify the energy when things are out of balance we have more stress and we have low soil energy and this really creates a situation where the pests and the insects and the weeds come in and our and the crop struggles um, there's really three types of energy that i think are important for us to understand to get balance and that's sunlight energy that creates you know, the glucose that feeds the plant and the microbes. You have the microbes that create energy in their process, and we have nutritional energy. Nutrients really drive energy. And when we're in crop production, that energy or that balance of energy should be going up over the growing season, not down. Now, in traditional agriculture, it's going down. Now, in our program, and we've perfected this over the last 40 years, is the full circle system. And you may have crops, or you may just, and you may have crops and livestock, and that's what this is showing here. And I'll give you an example. Uh, soil health is the foundation to everything, as we've been discussing. And so how we manage our, select our seed, with our seed coatings that we use, the biologicals, we like to promote those. We like to promote, uh, again, putting on biological formulations in the starter, or maybe with our residue or both. We like to use the uh, biological stimulant UBO. Uh, we like to make sure that we have the right nutrients in the right place at the right time. And we also have another technology that we've been working, Dennis and I, a lot with, and that's the Kytosan technology. And Kytosan has the ability to control naturally insects and diseases and nematodes as well as stimulate the plant to stay greener longer and be healthier and higher energy. And, and so these are very important. And then as we move to the fall, of course, we wanna look at managing that crop residue. Now, I'll give you an example of how this works. When I approach a dairy producer, let's say he's got 1,500 or 5,000 cows, the first question I like to ask him is, what's the greatest expense in your dairy operation? And of course, they'll say feed. And then I'll say, what is the efficiency of that dairy cow? And you could say the same thing for a beef cow or a steer or a lamb or any type of swine, is the efficiency of utilizing the energy and nutrition in the time that that feed passes from mouth to tail. In a cow, that's 30 hours. Now, I will ask him, what is that percentage of efficiency in taking and getting the energy and nutrition out of the feed? And sometimes they know, most of the time they don't, and it's about 45%, not really good at all. And, and so I will say to them then, well, if we can increase that five to 15%, would that help your bottom line? And of course they shake their head, yes. Well, then I use the full circle system then to describe to them how we are gonna put more nutrition and more energy into their forage or into their feed. And then if it's a high moisture, we're gonna fermentate it with microbes. And what is that, what happens then? Well, the microbes break that feed down into smaller energy and nutritional bites, and they get rid of all the aphitoxin, mycotoxins, 
and they add wonderful secondary metabolites that weren't originally there. So when you feed that cow or that animal, they don't have to eat as much because it's got more energy and nutrition in it. And then if we would use a, 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 a prebiotic in the feed and maybe a, a prebiotic in the water like Ubio, uh, that digestion is going to be even better. Now, the result of that, the cow is going to produce more milk, more better fat, more protein, and it's going to have better somatic cell count. There's going to be less mastitis. She's going to be healthier. She's going to milk longer, live longer. Now the calf from conception until birth is going to be healthier. So when it comes out of the cow, it's healthy, and it gets off to a good start. The biggest problem we have in livestock production today is we're utilizing low energy, low quality nutritional feed, usually with a lot of aphitoxin and mycotoxins in them, and the animal struggles. And so from conception until birth, I mean, if you look at the swine industry today, we're losing somewhere between 10 and 15% of our baby pigs from birth until when they go in the nursery. And that is really due a lot to the feed that we're feeding these animals and the environment they're in. So that's how we kind of utilize this full circle system to understand and to educate how we can be more profitable. And, of course, the crop cycle works the same way. We just don't have the livestock involved. So the foundational technologies are the microbiome that we talked about, and then we want that to be very diverse. Now, how these microbes work in the environment, the first role of a microbial community is to, to create a healthy environment to de detoxify and, and drop salt levels or anything there that shouldn't be there. Then they go about balancing that environment. And they produce enzymes. Enzymes are catalysts that cause reactions to occur. Microbes produce normally just one enzyme. They also produce secondary metabolites. It has a very specific function. And they operate in a chain reaction. And that's why the more diverse your microbial population, the more enzymes can be produced to functionally uh, create the healthy environment and get us to where we want. And then, of course, the nutrition. Nutrition is where they derive their energy, and it's a building block for their microbial bodies. The most important are the trace elements, because these are heavy molecules. They put taste, flavor, nutrient density, and energy into feed. They also are at the center of all en enzymes. Without them, we can't have the enzyme. And so that's why trace elements are so important, but most oftenly overlooked in our production programs. Now, the timelines and system components are you start in the fall. Why? Because fall is where we need to take care of that residue. Now, if we can get that residue broken down and the carbon and energy pulled in, the nutrition pulled in, and we can get rid of all the insects and diseases that are there with the microbial cocktail that we put on and trace elements, that's going to open the soil up. The soil will then be able to breathe. They'll be aerobic in nature. We'll bring in nitrogen from the air. We'll fix more nitrogen. We can dramatically reduce tillage and maybe go no-till. Next spring, we're going to have a better soil seed contact, and we'll get a better stand. And so that's why fall and starting in the fall is so important. Now, this I understand that fall is a very busy time of the year, but I think what we need to get a mindset on is that when we get the combine ready to go to the field, we need to get our sprayer ready. We need to get someplace we can put it in in the evening where it's warm. And we need to get this residue, whether it be corn or any kind of residue, soybean sprayed in the fall. And that is going to set the stage for next year. And I think you're going to get probably a five or more uh, return on your investment for every dollar you spend on your fall program certainly you're going to create a more balanced, healthy soil environment for the next year's crop. And then we'll have a pre-plant program, depending on how we got our system put together. At plant, we may be using in or after-plant type technology, the microbes, the UBO, and of course the nutrition. And then in season, we want to do our, our uh, do testing on our residue. Maybe we do the SAP test or Maybe we do the 
the uh, vegetative test to find out where we are. And there's things we can do there to booster the energy and nutrition. And then of course at harvest, we wanna collect the data and look at yield and uh, look at the quality of the stock, standability, and maybe even do some grain analysis. And then of course, after harvest, we start all over with our residue program. So we've got things we need to do at every part of the growing season. And the better we understand the seasonal dietary need of the crop during the growing season, the better we can meet that uh, as we uh, go through the season to meet the objectives that we're after. Now, natural crop management technologies include multi-species biologicals. Some of these biologicals that we would use in the fall can have up to 54 microbes in them. And all the cellulose uh, digestion microbes are there, et cetera, nitrogen fixers. And then we have those that have 29 to 25 microbes that we use either before plant, at plant, or after plant. And then we have the natural biological stimulants. That would be the UBO natural biological there. And we have uh, seed treatments, biological seed treatments that are very, very effective. And I like that because we get those microbes right around that seed. We put the nutrients and the stimulators with them, and it gets that seed off to a really good start. We've sold these for over 25 years, and we keep improving these every year. We've got some really exciting uh, new technologies we're going to bring into that area next year. And then we have natural uh, biocontrol agents for insects, nematodes, and diseases. Now, Dennis, maybe you can share with us what those technologies are, because we've talked about those in the past couple of months, and we're going to talk about them here, um, you know, in the coming series that we're doing on the full circle system. But what are we talking about there? So like the, the sea mineral product uh, is uh, we're using uh, <clears throat> um, sea crop. And what it is is basically it's ocean, ocean mineral, you know, ocean water. And it really seems to turn the plant on. Um, I've been using it in my garden uh, and I see it for myself. Um, it, you'll see the plants just kind of just come back to life a little bit. Um, they'll start producing more flowers, that type of thing. But you've got 90 different trace elements in there, so that's it's um, and and I think the, you know, the fact that we're putting a little bit of sodium in there is actually a good thing. I was just talking to uh, who was that? Oh, Tom from Afghanistan, and he was saying that they were seeing a a sodium uh, deficiency in the sand, and they were looking for different products to uh, try to raise that sodium level. And I mentioned the sea sea product, the sea crop, and He's like, oh, I didn't even think of that. So we're getting a little bit of sodium in there and it doesn't take a whole lot uh, because that's an electrolyte and kind of turns things on. Uh, you've got the natural ores, your soft rock phosphate, uh, the potassium sulfate, elemental sulfur. The soft rock phosphate is gonna be a lot better than your, uh, your acid treated phosphorus products like uh, MAP and DAP, uh, those types of products because those are quick release products um, and when they quickly release, they tie up with calcium and phosphorus or calcium and magnesium almost immediately. And so you only get about 10% uh, of that phosphorus is available to the plant. Uh, so that's not a very efficient way of putting phosphorus down. We like the soft rock phosphate that's got um, 40, 45, 50 different trace elements in it as well. Um, so that's another benefit. And it will actually increase the bricks level of the plants because it breaks down slowly. And that's also a good way to break, uh, bring phosphorus levels up in the, in the soil. So soft rock phosphate is definitely uh, a good way to do that. Potassium sulfate is uh, the better way to put potassium on. The problem is, is it's quite expensive. Um, but if you put uh, lower amounts of potassium sulfate on versus higher amounts of potassium chloride, you're going to be close to uh, the same cost per acre. Uh, so we definitely like going the potassium sulfate route. Um, both potassium and sulfur are going to give you, give the plant energy where potassium and, and chloride, you know, the chloride part of it, uh, we've got plenty of chloride in our soil for the most part. Um, we, uh, we're actually hurting your soil by salting it out and that type of thing. 
Elemental sulfur is uh, best to go on in the fall to raise our sulfur levels in our soil. Um, also helps with uh, sodium issues, uh, magnesium issues, things like that to lower those. Um, and um, by lowering the magnesium, lowering the so uh, sodium, uh, we're gonna get better soil um, aggregation, um, better soil structure, better infiltration, getting that water off the surface um, and things like that. Uh, I just realized my video is off, so sorry about that. <laughs> but so, 16% uh, of the humic acid um, concentrate, um, we're actually making that in our, um, you know, taking the humus solver and making that into 16%. And um, it's a nice product, um, highly available form of humic and fulvic acid uh, compared to the regular liquid and, and uh, liquid fulvic acid, li liquid humic acid types of products by just by and how they make it. Um, and then we've got the molasses and sugar and, and that type of thing. Um, and then of the cover crops. The cover crops are very critical. Um, uh, one of my customers out in Pennsylvania is really focusing on cover crops for next year. And he's going to try and plant green, uh, plant his soybeans green into um, a mixture of rye and whatever else he's going to have. I know he's going to have uh, cereal rye as one of the main ones. and I think some clover, um, um, some radishes and different things like that. Um, and just go away from tillage. Um, he's not going to use a, he didn't use a pre-emergence herbicide this year. He's got conventional soybeans. Um, so they're not, they're non-traded. Um, so he's going to try and go with this green program and knock the, uh, knock the rye down and hopefully have enough of a mat that he won't have to spray too many times, you know, with his uh, conventional herbicides, which haven't been working the best, especially on ragweed. So we're hoping to uh, kind of choke some of that ragweed out and not have to use as many chemicals. So, yeah. Well, thank, thanks, Dennis. And, you know, uh, also uh, we talked about bio uh, control control agents and that's using the Kaizen technology that we're really excited about. Dennis has been yep. doing a lot of work on that and we will be covering that in uh, the next couple of weeks in our series. On the fall residue program, we're gonna cover this in detail next week. Not gonna spend a lot of time here, but this is really the key, I think, to set the stage for next year. This residue is creating too much of a problem for us. It's, it's tying up our nutrients, our energy. It's creating uh, soil warm-up and issues in the spring. It's getting in the seed furrow. And I think uh, just managing this is going to get us uh, a long, a long, a long, farther along in our program. And get rid of all of the toxins that are in there and get that stuff break, broken down, pulled down in the soil profile. Um, We've seen where this has done properly a dramatic improvement in, in health in the health of the soil and the soil food web. And if we can get this soil aerated and aerobic and opened up and capture more nitrogen from the air, get better drainage and aeration, and reduce tillage dramatically, these are all cost savers, as Dennis mentioned. And then maybe look at some some green uh, companion crops. Uh, with our main crop that we're trying to grow. And I've got a lot of people looking at that right now, a lot of interest. And the other thing by reducing tillage, we leave that salt food web and that profile intact and we don't rip it apart all the time and let that stabilize. And you'd be surprised what these earthworms will do for you in providing balanced nutrition. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable. And of course, this is something that we talked about last week which is our microbial team, we call it, of technologies. Uh, these are very, very uh, broad-based microbial cultures that have the nitrogen fixers in them, uh, the converting of nitrogen, uh, again, uh, from some of the amino acids that are, that are, that are there, uh, making uh, phosphorus, potassium available, uh, digesting our cellulose, our lignans, our chitins, starches, waxes, and oils, improving the overall nutritional quality and balance in the rhizosphere around the root, um, even solubilizing 
iron, and we've see, seen where these formulations can actually attack and reduce iron corrosives without spending the money on a product to do that. So these are so diverse and they do so many things. They help with uh, nodulation of soybeans uh, with uh, for nitrogen fixation. They help clean up the soil from hydrocarbons and petroleums that a lot of our pesticides are high in. And uh, again, uh, make sulfur available and uh, for the plants to take up. And so these, these are very, very dynamic. And uh, here's an example of some of them. Um, the meltdown is what we use in the fall with our crop residue program. It's got 25 microbes in it. We use a, a pint to a quart per acre. And then uh, if you're organic, you use uh, 501 and in the fall for crop residue. And then you can come back in the spring with 401, and that is also organically approved. You can go right in furrow with that or as a pre-emergence. And, uh, and then we have, uh, you know, biocast that also could be used pre-emergence or side dressed. And, and then uh, in season, we have respite, which re really is an ethylene inhibitor, which a lot of that is being sold right now with the stress that we have in the crops. So, Again, the microbiome is the most important part of the of the system, along with with the the nutritional component. So, UBO, how can we use UBO? This is the topic we were going to cover a little bit more in depth now here tonight in our part two series. UBO, NBS, natural biological stimulant. We can use it on the seed. We can use it pre plant, at plant, early plant and foliar, and we can use in our fall residue program. Um, it moves ionically in water. Um, we've been working with this technology now for probably 12 years. It's really grown and expanding now. Uh, I'm going to show you some really unbelievable things. What we do know about Yibio is that wherever you have biological processes, uh, whether it, it be the soil whether it be, uh, for example, uh, uh, in the area of waste or manure digestion, uh, wherever you have biological processes, this technology will dramatically improve uh, the efficacy and results. I, I kind of like this little di diagram a lot of times. You know, UBO is kind of a unique technology, and most people aren't familiar with it and, uh, and how these type of technologies work. And so here... We've got the uh, two cavemen there pulling the cart of rocks and with square wheels. And uh, the guy behind him is bringing the round wheels and saying, uh, you know, hey, guys, I got a better way. It's going to make you more efficient. You're going to have better results. And you're really going to be happy. And the guy says, well, we're too busy. And the other guy says, oh, no, thanks. And, and so sometimes we get stuck in a rut and we're not willing to be open and really look at new opportunities that come along. But again, this can be used in crop production, soil remediation. We use it to clean up toxic soils, soils that are high in salt. We use it in livestock drinking water with unbelievable results. Uh, I just got another study in today that showed tremendous improvement in livestock performance and profitability uh, with using that in with the water. We can use it in manure treatment. We can use that uh, at the time of manure application and anaerobic digester, aquaculture, ethanol, and anything that has water around it, um, the technology works good with. So what is it? It's a natural biological stimulant that works with existing micro microorganisms in the environment or the community that's there to optimize and accelerate already existing natural processes. Now, what I found this year is I have discovered these new microbial formulations. If you're going out and trying to stimulate the in an industrial ag field that's been industrially ag farmed with toxins and high salt fertilizers for years, and we destroyed the microbiome or the microbial diversity, and you got few microbes there to stimulate, you'll see an effect. But when you put these dynamic microbial uh, technology products there, it's like, man, when you put you be on top of them, it's like putting gas on a fire. It just explodes. And so 
it balances and remediates soil, water, and uh, what we call manure or waste media. They're, it's non-toxic, environmentally friendly for soil, water, air, and animals. I actually drink it every morning in my tea, okay? And it, it, really what we're looking at here from the soil point of view, it's a soil conditioner, and it's, it's established as a balanced soil ecosystem by, you know, really the microbes producing the enzymes and the secondary metabolites to, again, take care of the issues from the standpoint of toxins or nutrients being tied up and breaking down residue. It improves the soil's ability to nourish plants, to uh, the soil's ability to absorb water and hold water, improve soil tilth, and again, that's part of reducing the tillage program. It's really an ideal soil and plant enhancer. It triggers the explosion of the beneficial microbes on the soil and on the foliage. And it just elevates the plant's natural defense mechanism, which improves plant health, minimizes diseases, insect pressures, and weather-related stresses. You know, when you look at crop production, really it comes down to two factors, reducing stress and increasing energy. And everything we do in our program has to be focused on those two items. If we can reduce stress, optimize the genetic potential, let that plant optimize itself at every point in the growing cycle instead of cutting back and making sure the energy is there to completely, you know, uh, fill out the seed on that corn or soybean to maintain the seeds that are there and get heavy test weight. Uh, that is really the key. When we look at conditioning and balancing of the soil, it really improves water utilization. We know when we have a balanced soil and good nutrition there and balanced nutrition and trace elements, our water efficiency goes way up. On corn, it takes about 5,000 gallons of water per bushel to produce it under industrial systems. In these systems, we're looking at probably 3,500 to 3,000 gallons. So it improves nutrient uptake. It helps balance unbalanced pH soils. It helps aerate the soil. And again, we talked about it helps with the, the, the salts and petroleum that are in the soil. So we kind of talk about it as being enhancing the natural process of balancing living systems. Again, the full circle system as we, we look at the technology. Now, this is a picture from a field down in Algona, Iowa, Whittemore area. Um, where we did a lot of our initial work with this technology. Uh, on the right is the control. The ears aren't filled as, out as well. They got more uh, fungal activity going on, aphitoxin, mycotoxins, than we do over here in the UBO field. And uh, so that is very obvious when you're in the field, when you when you see the difference. And, and again, we got a very simple label and it goes on at 12.8 ounces per acre, so a gallon does 10 acres. Here we see it where we put it on the seed uh, and uh, actually soak the seed in the UBO. And after 10 days uh, on a germ paper, uh, under ideal conditions, of course, in the greenhouse, we increase root mass 6.4% 6, 6 and shoot mass 10.4%. Now we know that it, it actually enhances the activity of microbes by actually speeding up the energy cycle uh, that drives the multiplication of microbes uh, to grow more rapidly. And when they do that, they produce more enzymes, secondary metabolites that drive the whole process of, of improving health in anything it's in, whether it be soil or, or livestock, uh, in, for example. And so uh, here again is the field there that we, we had down there at Whittemore, Iowa. You can see the corn on the right was treated, the corn on the left was not treated. And you can see the difference in, in the corn. Now, observations on the corn in the year of use, uh, we saw with the UBO increased rows on the corn ears. And of course, yield of corn is determined by the plants per acre, ears per stalk. The number of rows on the corn, the, the length of the ear, and also, the, again, the weight of the kernel. And um, we saw increased health in the foliage. It's tended to stay greener longer. Uh, and we had less ear mold. 
versus the control, we had more tip back. The ear link wasn't there as compared to the uvula. The health wasn't there. We had more diseases and more ear mold uh, were on the control area. Now, the next year, what was observed, and this was all done by a consultant down there, giving us this information, we had less standing water. Well, why? Well, UBO opens the soil up, so it's going to aerate and drain better. We saw faster corn emergence, improved early crop vigor, and it stayed uh, healthier through the growing season. Same thing here in the soybeans. You can see on the right, we're treated the previous year uh, uh, with the UBO versus the other field on the left. We had greener, healthier crop there in the soybeans. And again, we saw this earlier. This was uh, a field that I worked with uh, this young farmer with. And you can see again, the corn on the left treated with UBO. Uh, we'll show you some fields we just looked at here in June in Iowa that show very similar effect, uh, very noticeable. Uh, even when we get into uh, looking at uh, Tasseling, you're going to see uh, the, the corn on the right where it says control. That's the dividing line. You see the corn isn't quite as bulky. The tassels aren't as pre prevalent as we see in the UBO side. So even at tasseling, those for three or four days when the corn starts to tassel, the, the UBO side is going to tassel quicker. And what we notice, again, increased root mass, increased stem diameter, increased uh, ear mass. Very, very obvious uh, when you look at the ears and the stalk and the health of the of the plant. Now, here you can see it in the ears, and we got a lot of tip back in the control. Now, this was what without these microbial formulations. Can you, so you can imagine what we're seeing now when we put these microbes with it, where we got twenty five, you know, to, to twenty nine microbes in these uh, formulations now. Now, here's some pictures we took uh, June 17th in Iowa. We went down to Webster City, Fort Dodge area. Larry Eckhoff is a consultant out of uh, the Webster City area. Bob Wagner lives in Clear Lake. He works with Biodyne. Uh, they're, they're the company that has these biological formulations I've been talking about. Now, they've been putting this out and seeing really good results. So one day, uh, a week prior to this, the middle of June, Bob calls me one Thursday and says, Jim, are you sitting down? He says, I can't believe it. I was out with one of my large growers. We were driving down the road and we looked out the window and by golly, there was a green strip down through the field. And and I said to him, what do you do there? And he says, well, that's where I put that product you gave me, that UBO. And so they start checking and, and their product was given about a 12% increase in mass of the plant. And when they put UBO with it, it was 18% increase. So we picked up additional plant mass. So the next, so then on the 17th, we went to three of Larry Eckhoff's fields. And that's what I want to show you here is uh, what we saw in these fields. Here you see uh, Bob holding up in, in his right hand uh, the UBO biodyne and then on the left was just the biodyne now the biodyne was giving good results and uh, but you can see here where we put them together we really saw a tremendous increase in in mass uh, width of the leaf the greenness of the leaf was darker green very obvious when we weighed the plants this round to be selecting plants you can see here on the scale uh, weighing one plant uh, <clears throat> with the uh, control area versus the biodyne UBO area uh, where we just had biodyne. And then when we put the biodyne UBO together, we had a 61% increase in plant mass. And of course that's quite substantial. And look at the difference in stem diameter here, uh, a wider, healthier, stronger stem. And uh, we went to the second field. You can see the wider leaf, it's greener there. Uh, where we got the combination of products. You see the, the, the rows of corn are greener, they're filled in more, where we got the combination of product. Here, Larry is holding up uh, on his right hand. Let's see, no, that would be his left hand, I guess. Uh, you see the uh, biodyne plant only, and then the combination in his other hand was a lot larger, almost twice as big. Um, 
when you look at the, again the growth and the color and in the stem diameter, it's very very obvious. In this case, the combination of the two products give a 68% increase in overall weight. In the third field, Bob is holding the biodyne again Ubio uh, in his be his left hand, uh, the right side of picture as we're looking at it, and just the biodyne in his left hand. Now biodyne by itself was giving really good results, and again. In this case, where we measured the, uh, the weight difference in the plants, it was 90% difference in, in weight, quite substantial. And uh, this is what got Bob all excited. You can see here, looking at the stem diameter and mass of the plant, it's very, very obvious. Now, we've done a lot of yield monitor trials over the years with this technology, uh, and yield monitors don't lie. Here's one we did in 2012, where the UV, where the UV, now, this is just UBO by itself in with a starter. We didn't put any biological with it at all. And we ended up here with an 18.63 bushel difference that netted a grower another $65 an acre. Here's one we did this year. That one gave us about 28.7, uh, netted us another $100 an acre by using the UBO. Uh, again, very, very obvious. Here's one we did uh, with a grower down in uh, Nebraska uh, with a yield monitor he sent me. Uh, we saw about, in this particular case, about a five bushel difference. In the next one that he did, he had about a nine bushel difference. Here's some work we did out in South Dakota with one of Dennis's customers. You can see here, we're putting the natural plant food, biogma, manure uh, with a starter program, micronutrients, and then the UBO. You can see the difference in root mass, stem diameter, and ear girth. I mean, it's quite substantial. Yield monitor results from that area gave us uh, results of 17.8 uh, bushel. Uh, what well, we had 39.2, 17.6 bushel difference. These are all yield monitor trials. Trials we did around Albert Lee here. Over, uh, we saw like uh, you know we're looking at 19, 17, 15, 18 in eight bushel difference per acre. So these are pretty consistent. Uh, when we looked at soybeans, uh, we had about an eight bushel difference on a yield monitor trial. A uh, wheat, we see really good response. Uh, the wheat on the right, again, had a combination of the natural bioaugmented manure, the starter package, the micronutrient mix, and the UBO versus the control uh, there on the left side. The end of the result of that uh, return on investment, the the, uh, the grower netted another $46 uh, dollars an acre by using that combination with the UBO. Now, here's a trial uh, that we did uh, where we used bioaugmented manure, and we bought bioaugmented in, in a lagoon where it had no solids of any type and no odor to it. It was completely a tea-type material that we make. And we actually sell that product by the semi-load um, for a starter and foliar carrier. Uh, now, what we've got there is uh, the control on the right and the manure, the NPF, on the left without any UBO. In the middle is a UBO-treated area. So we put 10 gallons as a under-row treatment. And you can see with just the manure there in the first one, and we measured the EC, that's a way to measure salt. Now raw manure will be an EC of 32, and we can break it down under this program to an EC of 43. You can see there that it had a brick, uh, the manure by itself had a brick level of about 12.3, where we put the UBO with it, we had 14.8. So we increased the energy and nutrition in the plant sap. Now, the control by itself had an 8.9 brick level. If we take the control at 100%, adding the, the manure nutrient mix, we picked up 17%. But where we put the UBO with it, we picked up 29, 28 or 29% there. And, and so you can see the difference there. It's quite obvious when you look at the picture in, in the uh, four rows in the center, the impact that that has had. Now, we talked about measuring EC at salt levels. We use the refractometer to measure bricks. And uh, 
we just squeeze the juice on the refractometer, look in it, it's got a scale of zero to 30, and it'll give you a reading. This is a chart that I developed, and really what it shows you is that um, here's your brick scale on over here on the uh, left side, and the bottom is, is really the over the growing season uh, as the crop grows. Um, it shows here in that the lower the brick level in the crop, the more weeds, insects, and diseases that you're going to have, the more quality, nutrient, and energy. Anything below eight brick is garbage. Now, way, the way that the creator designed all this is anything that's not worthy of reproducing because of low energy and nutrition, the insects and diseases are there to take it out. That's what they're there for. If your soils are nutritionally out of balance, low uh, low energy, low nutrition, low low carbon, low biodiversity, that's when the weeds come in because they're there to balance and, and bring nutrients into balance. If you work on bringing the energy up in your crop and building biodiversity or bioactive carbon and nutrition, then your brick levels are going to start to rise. You get up to 12 or higher, insects won't go in the field because they sense that high energy and when they fly over they they sense that and their vision will tell them that's a healthy field we can't handle that and and then as you get up to 16 to 20 you get into energy you get above that you get into all the secondary metabolites that really <laughs> energy and nutrition and secondary metabolites that put taste flavor and nutrient density into food if you have a tomato in that 16 area versus one down here at six and put them on the shelf. In three days, that six brick will rot, and the eight, 16 to 18 will not rot, it'll dehydrate. So the idea is to have your crop in the brick scale be 12 or higher during the growing season, and the higher the better is really the key. And we can show you how to do that. We can also use UBO as a soil remediation product at a gallon per acre and it will remediate petroleum product salts and help detoxify soils. So the key takeaway here really is building healthy soils, think fence row farming, and bring the fence row to all your rows in your farm is this key to spending less and getting more. And when it comes to our livestock, if, if we're producing eight brick or lower feed, which most of it falls into, then we're, we're not going to have healthy livestock. We're not going to have healthy birthing of the animal. And profitability in our farming is really all about balance, which then helps reduce stress and bring energy into the system. And it all starts with that fall residue program. Uh, Dennis, what, what else would you have to add here or comments that we, you would have to make in the experience that you've had over the years? Of, of walking lots of cornfields, looking at the brick levels and uh, diagnosing the crop of below and above ground. What what other uh, things could you mention? Uh, the UBO produces uh, definitely a bigger root system, but also more root hairs. And the more root hairs you have, the better nutrition you'll be able to get into that plant, better water uptake that type of thing, and those root hairs are much easier for the microbes to break down, so you're going to get better uh, microbial mineralization and breakdown of the stock and breakdown of the roots and, and overall um, increase your organic matter, that type of thing, your organic carbon. So definitely the more root hairs, uh, the better things are, uh, the better for that plant and the better for the soil. Um, see, um, Seem to see a little bit better nitrogen um, efficiency. Uh, many times with the UBO fields, we would see, you know, like that white crusting under the leaves. It's uh, a symbol that, uh, or a sign that that plant is giving off a little bit of nitrogen. And uh, we see that all the time in those fields. Um, so I think we're getting, you know, good use and good efficiency of, of the nitrogen that we are putting out there. Uh, the soil does seem to aggregate um, uh, several of my growth in western Minnesota, um, have much looser soils now, um, much better, more aggregated soils for sure. 
um, more earthworms, um, better residue breakdown. We still have residue out there, but it's better. Um, so those are different things I see. Um, the one, um, the client that we mentioned from South Dakota there, uh, they did those trials on their own um, and told me after, the, after it happened and gave us the yield results after it happened. Um, so it was, it was kind of a surprise to me because I didn't know they were doing a yield trials. And uh, he called me up uh, at harvest and said, uh, this is what your stuff's doing and uh, it's pretty impressive. So um, it was a nice surprise. Well, Dennis, it's even more impressive now that we've got this microbial team technology that we've been able to access with all these wonderful microbes in it that do all these uh, really functional things. But it, you know, part one, we talked about the, this team of microbes. Part two tonight, we talked about what will fire these microbes up and really, really give us results. And you mentioned the nitrogen thing. My gosh, Dennis, there's 30, 34,000 tons of nitrogen above every acre, and it's free. And many of you know the elements that make up a majority of the plant mass, 97.5%, a large percentage of that comes right out of the air. You know, your oxygen, your carbon, your nitrogen, your hydrogen. Yeah, a little bit can come out of the soil, and the healthier soil, the more... Uh, the more uh, carbon you can get on that other part of the leaf as it's coming up. But uh, again, this is really, really the key. But would you agree, Dennis, that it really comes down to managing stress and in the crop and optimizing the energy part of the whole equation? Yeah, for sure. Um, this year, and we're talking about stress because usually I'm in central Minnesota and usually we're planting into frost and uh, this year our frost did not go near as deep and we did not plan into frost and I think the crop looks much better because of it. So that is definitely, a, you know, a stress right there. But um, when you have cold conditions like that, you're not also not going to get the best breakdown of, of residue and, and right. that definitely makes a big difference. So if we can get something on that residue in the fall and get things started to break down, um, and if you get some good snow cover, that type of thing, too, you'll have some microbial act action under that snow cover. Um, and I think, and, yeah, and Dennis, I, yeah, I think there's a lot of toxins in that residue that we need to get broken down, too. It kind of creates an allelopathic effect. And yeah. uh, even, even our cover crops, you know, um, helping those get kind of broken down and augmented back into the soil. So that, that's, that's really important. Well, we've run out of time. And John, do we have a question uh, here tonight that somebody's asking? I don't know if we do or not. No, I don't see anything on the chat and there's nothing on the Facebook. Okay, okay. all right. Then if you need more information, uh, this is our contact uh, information. It's also on our website. And uh, don't hesitate to email us or call us. And we will help you as best we can on, on anything that you're dealing with and be more happy to visit with you. If you're interested in uh, learning more and, and want to really get a head start, all residue program, I think, is really the key. And we are going to cover that uh, next month in August. And again, it would be the first Thursday, it would be the third Thursday night from eight to nine, like we're doing tonight here in July. And, uh, and we'll continue talking about the full circle system and achieving uh, more profitability for our operation. So we welcome you to join us at that point. So with that, I want to walk, I want to thank everybody for being on tonight. And, uh, and again, I know that you're, you're kind of, maybe winding down from the season and hopefully can take some time with the family. Uh, the crop uh, is moving along nicely, at least around Albert Lee here. I know it, it, it's different in other areas, but we've had 10 days of wonderful, what I call good humidity and rain and, and really good temperatures, not too hot for the most part in that 75 to 80 degree hot for the most part in that 75 to 80 degrees. So the corn is really kicked in. We see now, I saw today with the ears on the corn are starting to silk. So, uh, you know, 
we're in good shape around here. And I hope you are in the areas you're, you're at too. So with that, thank you and God bless each one of you. Good evening.